The Unnatural is brought to you by Hermit's Book Productions. The following is mature content. Listener discretion is advised. Choices. Do you ever think about the choices we make? No. Not the easy ones. The tough ones. The ones that affect those around us. The ones we love. Like looking the other way. Not speaking up. Not taking a stand. Not accepting those that are different. Running away. Choosing fear over faith. Over love. Not believing. Not even when the unnatural is staring you right in the face. And the demons born of those choices will fuel hate for generations to come. A series of these very choices has brought us to the remote mountains of northern New Mexico in a quaint log cabin. It sits alone in a clearing surrounded by dark woods. Wind and snow swirl all around the wraparound porch, covering it in white. Detective Michael Barella, a stubborn and lost soul, is passed out in an old rocking chair, his nose red from the cold. Barella is a callous and cynical man. Grief and loss cling to him like the disheveled clothes he's been wearing since the day before. The wind blows through his unkempt salt and pepper hair. Two days worth of stubble covers his face. Cold air stings his watery blue eyes. He looks around, a mixture of surprise and confusion. He glances at the half-drank bottle of whiskey on the table next to him. The The button is stuck and won't move. Satisfied with the unplugged radio, he turns to make his way inside. Something shimmers in the snow and catches his eye. Down the steps and across the lawn, Barella picks up the metallic object. It's a shiny gold New Mexico State Police badge. He flips it over in his hand. Inscribed on the back, is the name Carlos Sandoval. Disappointment hangs off Barella like heavy saddlebags. Suddenly, in the tree line ahead of him, eyes, black, reflective eyes, stare at him, into him. The eyes emerge from the woods and move fast toward him. They never blink. The oily spears are attached to the bloody body of a man. He wears a freakish grin as he bounds across the clearing like a wolf hunting its prey. Barella steps back, pulls his pistol, and points. Stop! Stop!
Nestled in those same mountains is the small town of Las Vegas, New Mexico, where three days earlier we meet an anxious New Mexico State Police detective as he makes his way down a snow-covered sidewalk. This is Detective Rafael Ramos. Rafael is a handsome man in his mid-twenties. His suit is pressed and his hair is neatly in place. He stops for a moment and stares up at an abandoned movie theater. His eyes hold hope despite the things he's seen. Well, here we go. This wasn't the same town he left six years ago. Nor is this the Neonopolis Las Vegas you were probably thinking of. This is the Las Vegas that was founded in 1835. The one where Billy the Kid gambled and hit out. And Doc Holliday killed his first man outside a saloon. It's a Las Vegas with a proud people and a haunting past. Steeped in legend and lore. Still trying to find itself in a modern world. Charlie Spick and Span. Every small town has one. That friendly and warm breakfast spot everyone finds their way to before starting their day. A diner not meant to be retro, but lost somewhere in time with the Southwest theme. Now, shrouded in colorful tinsel and Christmas lights. The scent of roasted chilies and freshly made tortillas waft throughout the diner. On the walls, eccentric art depicts menu items the locals have made famous. No. No. Borella sits alone at a table for two, conspicuously pushed in a corner by itself. A half-eaten breakfast burrito smothered in green chili and a large glass of ice water sits in front of him. He talks into a cell phone. Look, Rosa, I said I'll be there. I'll be there. I gotta go. Ramos, over here. Detective Barella, it's you a pleasure. You want coffee? You gotta serve yourself. You want a burrito or something? I'll flag down Sophia and she'll put one in the window for you. Oh, uh, I'm good, thanks. I just grabbed good. it. Good. No reason to waste time. Have a seat. Raphael notices none of the servers acknowledge Barella or him. It's like they're not there. Look, I'm sorry about Sandoval. I know that you guys are close. He was a good cop. Barella tenses at the mention of his partner. These were his cases. A couple of active burglary and theft rings, one in Bernal, I think the other's in Romeroville. All drug fueled. I'm pretty familiar with those areas. There's a lot of vacation cabins going in when I left. I've attached a list of possible streets of them. You'll see a theme there. Same tweakers on most of them. Huh. You're welcome. Thanks. Barella. <sighs> Looks like you just got your first case. Barella drives them in their unmarked police car down old and skinny streets. Dark and empty antebellum era homes stare down at them as they pass. The streets soon give way to an even emptier downtown district. So what do we have? Carjacking. In the plaza? Raphael stares out at the few shops still open. My God, after six years, this place has not changed a bit. What do you say we keep this to detective shit? Huh? They've reached the heart of Las Vegas, the plaza. Narrow streets spread from it like veins. An off-white gazebo sits at the center of a roundabout, void of all life, minus a homeless man bundled in blankets. Bright Christmas lights line the stores and contrast the emptiness of several old, out-of-business shops that line the downtown corridor. Hermit's Nook, a quaint bookshop with a mystic flair, sits across from the gazebo, nestled between decrepit buildings. A light is on in the apartment above the old shop. The New Mexico State Police Station sits catty-corner to it, 
plain and sad. A lazy strand of Christmas lights droop from the gutters. And next to that is the historic Plaza Hotel, a large red brick building that looms over the park. Raphael and Barella stand on the sidewalk across from the hotel. A young patrol officer approaches. Confusion displayed across his face. This is Officer Jacob Mendoza, a local to the town, but a rookie to the department. Got the call at a 0708 hours. A couple over there from Texas says a woman in her 40s forced them out of the truck. He hands Barella a clipboard with a report. Barella hands it off to Raphael and walks over to the victims. Thanks, officer. We got it from here. Hey, you Sandoval's replacement? Uh, yeah, I am. It's a shame, man. Sandoval, he was a good cop. He was also the only one that could keep Barella in check. What do you mean? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Barella's a great detective. He's just a dick. Good luck. Huh. Cynthia Shelton, a small middle-aged woman, stands shaking next to her husband, Ray Shelton. Her face is contorted in pain from the hot coffee spilt all over her lap. Ray stands only a few inches taller than his wife and is built like a sock puppet. She was scared. It was like she was running from something. That was a brand new truck, officer. Special ordered lariat edition. Oh, the bells and whistles. God damn it. Was someone chasing her? I don't know. I didn't see nobody. Fuck, man. I just but off the it sure seemed man. like it. Because that girl was horrified. You got a good look at her? She was a little Tell Hispanic about the crazy girl. Fucking eyes. Crazy eyes. Homeless looking. Scrawny. Uh, did you see a weapon? No. I just parked and was grabbing coffee out the console. And she just showed up out of nowhere and yanked me out. No weapon, huh? And what did you do? She was awful intimidating, officer. I mean, it, it all happened so fast. Was she... You gave your contact info to the other officer, correct? Yes, sir. We'll be in touch. Barilla turns and leaves the couple on the sidewalk. Raphael hesitates, then follows. Hey, I, I appreciate you taking the lead on this, but I still had a few more questions for them. I'm... Not the lead. Put the info in NCIC, have dispatch broadcast the description, then hit up the regional LPRs. A Ford that new will be in Mexico by dawn. You know, detective shit. Across the plaza, standing at her open living room window, we find Aurora Ortiz. She stares out over the scene, watching the two detectives leave the Texan couple. Her shop, Hermit's Nook, sits below her. Aurora is a short, eclectic Hispanic woman in her mid-twenties. Her hair is long, black, messy, and pulled in a loose bun. Her clothes clash in decades. It's stylish in a way only Aurora Ortiz could pull off. Her apartment is cluttered with plants, paintings, and various types of colorful candles. Cladovia Ortiz, a frail Hispanic woman who bursts with love, makes her way into the living room, a steamy mug of tea in her wrinkled hands. Buenos dias, mijita. Buenos dias, abuelita. Cladovia sits on the old couch in the center of the room. She pats the spot next to her. Come, sit for a second. The shop opens in 30 minutes. The shop is closed today. What do you mean? Do you remember what your father taught you about almas agonizando? Yeah, he said that sometimes a person's spirit can visit living relatives to say goodbye before they've passed on. He visited me last night. I woke up and he was by myself. 